You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. As Jesus has ascended into heaven, he's getting ready to go and he tells his disciples, now listen, you're going to receive power. That's the same word, dunamis. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And they were. How? Not in their own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever wondered, I mean, think about it, why sometimes we step out and do things and it flops? Why is that? Well, it's because we're trying to do it in our own strength, our own power. When performing an activity in which we are confident, we may display our inner strength or intellect. However, there are times when you may feel helpless and unable to see a way out. Who can you rely on? In today's message, Pastor Ron explains how Jesus can help you in your time of need. Instead of relying on yourself, you need to learn to trust Jesus to guide you in the right direction. He can help you overcome every obstacle that comes your way. God can give you the wisdom you need to face your trials. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Colossians chapter 1 with today's edition of Large Than Life. So Colossians 1, today we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 14. And of course, we've entitled this entire book, Elements, as Paul talks about the core elements of the Christian faith. I was reading about a little girl who went up to her mommy and said, Hey, mommy, why, why, when she was cooking in the kitchen, why do you cut off the ends of the meat when you put it into that pan? She said, well, I think it's just to help soak up juices, you know. But, you know, I learned that from my mom. Why don't you ask grandma? So the little girl goes to grandma, grandma. Why do you cut off the ends of the meat when you put it in the pan, you know? She goes, well, I think it's to help soak up, you know, the juices, but I'm really not sure. Why don't you ask Nana? The little girl was a little frustrated, so she goes over to ask Grandma, Grandma, why do you cut off the ends of the meat to put it in the pan? She goes, well, I have no idea why your mom and Grandma do it. Um, My pan was simply too small, so I had to cut off the ends. That was simply it. Isn't it amazing that sometimes we do things simply because, you know, that's the way it's always been done, or we do things not knowing why? Well, really, as we come to these verses today, what we have is Paul praying for the church, and as he does, he's going to express God's desire for every believer. Ultimately, God wants us to grow. However, Paul also gives us the reason why. And it's because of all that Christ has done for us. So if you can grasp that, you'll get a better understanding of of really where we're going this morning. So now, just follow along as I read, beginning in verse 9. Paul writes, For this reason also, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled, and here's God's desire for all of us, that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has, and here's why, here's what God has done for us. He's qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So there really is a lot we're gonna be looking at here If you noticed here, God desires that we be filled with his will, walking worthy, a fruitful walk, strengthened, joy, many things. And again, this ought to be our desire as believers as well. When we realize what God has done for us, as we read, he's he's qualified us, he's delivered us, he's redeemed us. That said, I've entitled this section, Acquire the Desire. As Paul talks about God's desire for every believer and the reason why we ought to have this same passion. So that said, if you look in your outline, we're gonna divide it up just in two sections. We have God's desire for every believer, that's verses nine through 11, and we have God's depth of love for every believer, that's verses 12 through 14. So let's jump right into this. God's desire for every believer. Paul is praying here, keep in mind. So notice he says, for this reason also, since we day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Well, what did he hear? Well, he heard that this church was thriving, doing really well in the city of Colossae. Also, though, that they were experiencing some false doctrine starting to come in. And and so he says, I don't cease to pray for you. And how important it is that you and I pray for one another. Ephesians chapter six and verse 18 tells us we should be praying for one another. In fact, it's one of the weapons of our spiritual armor that we can use for one another. It's one of the greatest things we can do. And I covet your prayers and man, I love praying with you. Notice Paul says, we don't cease to pray for you though. 
Now, does that mean that he prayed for this church and these people 24 7? Well, no, what it means is that every time that Paul prayed, God had placed them on his heart. And so he was praying without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5 17 tells us that all of us are to pray without ceasing. Now, does that mean that we're supposed to pray 24 7? In other words, our eyes closed, our heads bowed, and our hands folded, you know? No, because if we did, we'd be bumping into everything and we wouldn't get anything done. Praying without ceasing is the idea that I have what you might call God consciousness throughout the day. Prayer is simply communicating with God. It's talking with God. So throughout the day, everything that happens in my life, I am talking with God. I'm communicating with him. I'm saying, Lord, is this is what you want me to do today? I come into a situation, I'm throwing up a prayer. God, what is your will here? How do I deal with this? If I'm driving down the freeway and I see an accident, I'm praying for those people involved in it. Throughout the day, I'm praying without ceasing. So Paul is saying here, God has placed you on my heart and I'm praying for you regularly. Now let's look specifically at his prayer and here we see six things that God desires for every believer. The first is he prays that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. God wants us to be filled with the knowledge of his will. That word filled there is a great word. In the Greek, it's the word pleruu and it means to be, well, saturated is one of the words absolutely saturated, so it's overflowing. A better uh, idea would be if you took a piece of chalk and you threw it into a cup of ink, left it there for a while, and then took that piece of chalk out and broke it in half, it would be saturated. That's what the word means. It's used in John 12, 3 to speak of Mary when she poured out that perfume. It says the fragrance saturated filled the house. It was also used to speak of something that was dominated by something dominated and controlled by, because if something is filling you completely, it dominates you, it controls you. It is used to speak of of Stephen in Acts chapter six and verse five when it says he was filled with faith and of the Holy Spirit. We know that Stephen, one of the first uh, deacons of the church, was a man dominated by faith and controlled by the Holy Spirit. So what Paul is saying here is he's praying that we would, same word, be saturated, dominated, and controlled by the knowledge of God's will. Now, the question is, where do I find God's will? So glad you asked. We find it right here, right in God's word. A lot of people think, well, God's will is just very, very difficult to understand. In fact, some people kind of see God as up in heaven playing some kind of a cosmic hot and cold game with us. You know, we're stepping forward, you're getting warmer, you're you're getting colder, and you're, you're trying to somehow find God's will this way. Not at all. God has given us his will right in his word. And so what I'm gonna do, just on this first point, I know there are are many things we're covering here, but this is important. I'm gonna give you six things that begin with the letter S, easy to remember, right out of God's word, that will tell you what God's will is for your life. Because it tells us that right in the scripture. So let me give you the first one. So if you're writing, take notes fast. Number one, it is God's will that you be saved. In 1 Timothy 2, 3, it says, God wills all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. So God's wonderful plan for your life begins by being saved. So if you're not saved, please be born again today. And God's great plan for your life will begin to unfold. Number two, it is God's will that you be spirit-filled. In Ephesians 2, 17, it says, this is, or 5, 17, this is the will of God for you, verse 18, that you be filled to the Holy Spirit. And the word filled is the same one we looked at. It means dominated and controlled. So when the Holy Spirit is directing my life, well, then I can understand what God's will is. So saved, spirit-filled, or spirit-directed. Number three, it's God's will that you be sanctified. Now, that sounds like a very sanctimonious word. The word simply means set apart. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it says, this is the will of God for you, that you be sanctified and walk in purity. So God wants us set apart to him, not unto the world, but unto him. Number four, it's God's will that we be submissive. 2 Peter 2, 13, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to all authority for this is God's will. So he wants us to be those who are humble, who submit to authority. Number five, it is God's will, and I don't like this one a lot, that we be willing to suffer, suffer, 1 Peter 3, 17, for it is God's will to suffer then doing good rather than doing evil. So there are times when I stand up for what is right and I may have to suffer for that and be right in the will of God. And then finally, number six, it's God's will that I be satisfied. 
Literally, we might say content. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In all things give thanks. Be content, for this is the will of God. So when you think about this, I mean, God wants me to be saved, spirit-filled or dominate or controlled, sanctified, submissive, being willing to suffer and satisfied with whatever comes in my life. You say, well, wait a second, pastor. I wanna know, this is my concern about God's will. Uh, Should I get married or not? Should I quit this job and start another one or not? Or should we move out of this home or do that? And I understand these are the minor things that we deal with on a day-to-day basis, God's will. And I want to say this, if you want those things to work out, first of all, get the other six in line, get saved, start being led by the spirit, submissive to his word, growing in it and all these other elements. And you know what? God will very, very clearly begin to lead you. So knowing God's will is not, you know, this so difficult. What I find is most people don't want to do the others. They just want these little quick fix things instead of really walking in the spirit. So it's God's will or God's desire that we walk in his will, notice, in all wisdom, verse nine, and spiritual understanding. The word wisdom, Sophia, so if your name's Sophia, at least you got wisdom by name, right? That simply means knowledge properly applied. And the word understanding, sunesis, spiritual understanding, means biblical comprehension. So knowing God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding is apprehending God's word, which contains God's will, and applying it. So that's number one, God's desire controlled, filled with the knowledge of his will. Number two, and we'll move a little faster on these. It's God's desire that we walk worthy. Verse 10, he says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. The word walk used throughout the New Testament, the analogy is always used again and again. It simply means one's manner of daily living or one's daily conduct. So he's saying our daily conduct ought to walk worthy of the Lord that pleases him. Now, that seems pretty hard to do. How could I walk in such a way that I'm really pleasing the Lord? Well, God helps us. We're not left to our own resources. In Galatians 2.20, Paul writes, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ is living in me. So Christ is enabling me daily to walk worthy. Trying to do it on my own strength is a practice in futility, really. So a great verse that I always cling to almost daily is Philippians 4, 13. I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm constantly reminding myself of that. It's the only way I can walk worthy in a way that pleases him. But that is God's desire for my life. It's God's desire for your life. There's a third thing. God desires that we bear fruit. Notice he says, being fruitful in every good work. How do we do that? Well, John 15, five, you're familiar with it. Jesus said this, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Then he goes on to say, for without me, you can do nothing. That word abide means to remain. As we remain in Christ, as we walk worthy, as we walk in his spirit, I bear fruit. And keep in mind, Paul, of course, is talking to Christians, right? He's praying for believers. This is God's desire for the believer. So let me say this. First of all, every Christian bears fruit. Every Christian bears fruit. It's the natural byproduct of being saved. Now, some Christians, you have to look really hard. You have to get through all the leaves, and there's a few little berries there. There they are, but there's fruit. You know, if you're walking with Christ and you walk away for a time, you're living a carnal life, you're gonna be bearing a little fruit, but there will be fruit. There is no such thing as a fruitless Christian. If you have no fruit in your life, then your salvation is suspect. But if you are saved, there will be fruit. The Bible tells us that. Now, what does this fruit look like? Well, we talked about it a couple studies ago. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 makes it very clear. It says the fruit of the Spirit is. And here's what it looks like. It's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that show us if we have fruit. Now, you say, well, I don't know if I have it. Well, if you're married, ask your spouse. They'll tell you. There's an honest answer right there. No, actually, you don't. Oh, okay. You better work on that. I see a little fruit, but you better work on that, bucko. We're going to the marriage conference in two weeks. But the fact is, we are to bear fruit. This is what God loves. And John 15, 5, it says, the Lord desires us to bear much fruit. You know what? God doesn't want us to be nominal Christians. He doesn't want us to be just get by Christians. He wants us to be bumper crop 
Christians, bearing fruit. Bearing, or it says right here, being fruitful in every good work. That's, that's what I want. That's what I want. Now, number four, it's God's desire that we mature. Look at this, verse 10, he continues, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That word increasing in the original language means and to cause to grow or mature. God wants us constantly growing. You know, when my children were very, very young, and as you, maybe some of you still have, you know, infants, and they're just, they haven't talked yet, but they're getting near to that place, you know? And it's so exciting. The first thing they do is just make bubbles come out of their mouth. You know, and you're like, it's always exciting. It's almost there, you know. Before I had children, I thought, that's gross. Once you have your own kids, like, that's so cool. Look at that. It almost formed little bubble words. And then they get to that point where they actually start saying a few words, and you're so excited. Then they finally say, you know, daddy. You know, it's like, yes, look at my kids said daddy, you know. So that's awesome. But wouldn't it be tragic if, you know, you bring in your 18-year-old son. Hey, son, come on over. Show him what you can say. Daddy. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. That's disappointing. You need help, right? Well, think about this. Isn't that some, doesn't that happen to some Christians? They don't grow. They get saved, and yet they don't mature. They don't grow, and that's the same analogy. So the fact is, we are to grow. He says, increasing in the knowledge of God. My walk with the Lord ought to certainly be a lot further than it was 18 years ago or a year ago. Listen to 1 Peter 2.2. It says, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow. How do we grow? Through the teaching of God's word. Uh, listen to the New Living Translation. I love the, way, love the way it puts it. You must crave pure spiritual milk so that you can grow into the fullness of your salvation. Cry out for this nourishment as a baby cries for milk. We know that when an infant is hungry, it does one thing. It just cries until it's satisfied. Now, that passage is not saying stay an infant spiritual infant, what it's saying is, throughout your Christian walk, continue to crave God's word and you will grow. Number five, God desires that we embrace his strength. Look at verse 11. He says, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. I love this word might, and we've shared it many times before. It's the Greek word dunamis. We get our English word dynamic or dynamite from it. God wants us to be empowered with, well, dynamite, his dynamite power, the power by which he supplies. That's how we're strengthened. And when we are, when we lean upon his strength and his power, wow, God can do awesome things. I love Acts chapter one and verse eight. As, the, as Jesus has ascended into heaven, he's getting ready to go and he tells his disciples, now listen, you're gonna receive power. That's the same word, dunamis. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're gonna be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And they were. How? Not in their own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever wondered, I mean, think about it, why sometimes we step out and do things and it flops? Why is that? Well, it's because we're trying to do it in our own strength, our own power. Before our first service, you know, a bunch of us guys got together and we were praying. And men, I think men, we have a greater a proclivity to fall into this trap. Because as men, we, we see a problem, we wanna fix it, okay, what's it take? Okay, get your checklist off, and we wanna, we'll fix it and get it going. And we tend to do that something, sometimes before ever stepping back and praying and seeking the Lord. Lord, how do you want me to approach this? What do you wanna do? And so this is something we all need to do. We need to back up and say, I, Lord, I need your strength, I need your power, because if I step out in my own strength, it's just gonna fall flat. And so embracing his power, his strength. Notice it says, strengthened with all might, all power. Not just a portion, but all of God's power. You might call it colossal power. And that's available as we lean upon him, trust in him. Now finally, number six, it's God's in desire that we endure with joy. Endure with joy. Uh, he says at the end of verse 11, uh, for all patience and long suffering with joy. Now, now, this is kind of a beautiful picture. The word patience, of course, means to persevere. It could mean to endure. But it's always used in the context of difficult circumstances. You know, We all have difficult trials and circumstances, and that's what it means to persevere, to go through it, to endure. The word long-suffering is different. It's macrothumia. Sometimes, it, well, what it really means is long-tempered. And it's always used in the context of not difficult situations, but difficult people. So the first has to do with things, the second has to do with people. 
which is kind of interesting because sometimes we can patiently endure a difficult situation, but when it comes to a certain individual, oh, forget about it, you know. Now, I realize no one in this church ever deals with any of that. I realize that, but some do. And so he includes them both. Collectively, he is saying, God wants us to be men and women of endurance. Whether it's a circumstance or a person, he wants us to be those who have our eye on the prize that no matter what I have to deal with in this life, I'm, I'm not concerned about it. I'm gonna deal with it because the Lord is in control and I can even have joy in the midst of it. That's important, right? Notice he says this patience and long-suffering with joy. He doesn't want us to go through life, uh, you know, gritting our teeth, okay, I'm gonna go through it, I'm gonna make it, oh, joy, you know, no. He wants us to really have joy. How can I do that? Well, it's possible as I keep my eyes on my Lord, on my Savior, and Jesus gives us the example. In fact, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, it starts off by telling us to do it. It says, in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and he's referring to the chapter earlier where it talks about all the great men and women of faith who have gone before us. Since they've been able to do it, it says this. It says, well, let us lay aside every weight and sin that easily slows us down and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And then it says this, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, even suffering the shame. So Christ had joy in the midst of overwhelming circumstances and people, yet he had joy. How is that possible? Because he knew it was the cross that would secure our salvation. And the writer to the Hebrews point and Paul's point is this, if he can endure it, how can I not endure the hardships of this life with joy? knowing what Christ has done for me and knowing that I'll be with him forever. And so God's desire is that we trust him, that we endure all that we, you know, comes our way with joy. I love 2 Timothy 2.10, it says this, if I am willing to endure anything to bring salvation and glory unto Jesus Christ, I do so. For if we die with him, we'll live with him. And if we endure with him, we will reign with him. So encouraging. One day I'm gonna be with the Lord. And so all that I deal with here, well, it's really not a whole lot. Second Corinthians uh, chapter four and verse 16 says it's a light affliction. It's just for a moment, but it's working in me a greater eternal weight of glory. So what is God's desire for us as believers? Well, that we be filled with his knowledge, the knowledge of his will, that we walk worthy, that we bear fruit, that we mature, we continue to grow, that we embrace his strength, not our own, and that we endure to the end with joy. Now, that's an awful lot. God wants us to acquire that desire. Now, let's look at the second part of his prayer here in verses 12 through 14, and this is the reason why we ought to do it, as we understand God's depth of love for every believer. Now, some important observations in the first part of verse 12. Notice he says here, giving thanks to the Father. Again, this is a prayer, but he's saying, I'm giving thanks. Now, this is so important. Think about this. Isn't it true from the time our children are very young, we teach them how to say thank you? From the moment they can reach out and ask for a little piece of food, you know, or reach for a toy, and we'll give it to them and we'll say, now what do you say? Thank you. Like, All right. You know, we're instilling into them that important principle. But I have found that in our Christian walk that so often, even in our prayer time, well, thanks gets kind of put to the lower shelf. A lot of times we just come to prayer and we say, I need this, 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 and this. And, uh, oh yeah, thanks God for doing that thing over there the other day. Even if we remember to give thanks, it's given a secondary place. Psalm 107 and verse 21 says, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord though for his goodness. How important that is. I know I did a study called Tabernacle Prayer. It's, uh, I use various patterns for my time of prayer to stimulate it and, and make it rich. And one of the things I shared was Tabernacle Prayer, talking about using the tabernacle as a pattern for different ways to remind you to pray for all things. And I kind of started off with Psalm 100 and verse four where it says, you know, come to his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts to praise. The first thing the recipient was to do before they even came was to worship and praise and give thanks to God. Thanks for joining us here today on Larger Than Life as we go through the book of Colossians. Within this letter from the Apostle Paul, you find that there were some problems in the region of Colossae. There were some people who didn't believe that Jesus truly was God. This type of false teaching can enter into any church, and it's wise to be on guard for that in your community of believers. The most important thing about all of this is to know the Word of God and to live it out practically to those around you. 
May these messages further inspire you to continue on in your walk with God, not being swayed by things that are untrue. For more messages like this one, go to ltlradio.org. Don't forget that we also offer Larger Than Life in podcast format. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. You can also download our mobile app at ltlradio.org. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Calvary Houston, where Pastor Ron Hint teaches. We'd love for you to come visit or to join us regularly to be a part of the ministry going on here. If you have questions about what you heard today, feel free to call us at 281-648-5800. That's 281-648-5800. We're so happy that you joined us in the book of Colossians. Won't you come again? We'll be waiting right here on Larger Than Life.